<clears throat> it's been a it's been a, a journey, and I don't. I, 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 what I'm saying is, I don't know what I believe about the afterlife and about what shape we take once we die and all of that. I believe sort of energetic things about that, but I I know I know for a fact that mom is no longer constrained by her physical form and her mental uh, constraints over time. And, or, and also uh, whatever was pursuing her in her mind that made her, she, she, she got some paranoia toward the end of her life, uh, which I attribute to early childhood stuff that happened in Germany before they got out. Mm -hmm. So That photo album, Jerry, was unbelievable. Thanks. I mean, it really felt like I got a different experience of your mother too. And there was a lot of cute Jerry in there as well, but... Um, yeah, the, the the glamour. Yeah, mom was a glamour puss. Mm -hmm. And I and and I was uh, I talked about this a little bit on the call that just happened, which was an OGM call, and I I was reminiscing that I don't know where she got that from. Like somehow, mom got a hold of fashion magazines and styly sort of things, and then just went went you know all in on it, at, but not in the way of going and traveling to Paris and buying Givenchy from Givenchy. But in the in the way of subscribing to Vogue and Bazaar, which were always on our coffee table, and tearing out pages and taking them to her dressmaker and saying, "Can you do this?" Uh, and then you know, <laughs> next next party, mom would be decked out in something that looked pretty damn good. Um, so the, the practical hacker's Peruvian way of doing this. Um, so yeah, so it's so this also if frees up a, the hunk of my brain that was tied up in managing mom's descent in a, in a way um, can now pay attention to other sorts of things, which is, which is good. So, and everybody, and everybody has been just fabulous and supportive and lovely. And, and that's been, it's been a treat just to, just to absorb and to, to feel replenished by, by everybody's wishes. Mm. So that's good. Thank you. And I can vouch for that too. I've had sort of a 50 yard line, a seat at the 50 yard line in, in a few different ways, but not ways that everyone necessarily re recognizes. Um, I mean, I think it's clear that like watching Jerry navigate all of this has just been like a, a lesson in grace and a lesson in equanimity and a lesson in like how you do this with candidly one of the most difficult people I've ever met. Um, right, and 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 I, couple things there you guys know like I lost both my parents young so I know death really well but I know sudden tragic like instantaneous death that comes out of nowhere I don't know I found myself really um yeah I guess Jerry you might say like able to help but not I didn't have the answer like I didn't have tips on hospice I didn't have you know it was new for me as well and so just watching him navigate this has been quite extraordinary um also though um, I have not known a day in life with Jerry without his mom being, and again, I say, I, I completely, completely, um, how do I say that? I, re I really, I respect her as a human. I respect her as Jerry's mom. Um, I have never had a relationship with her. Um, she never really liked me. I never really liked her. Um, it ran both ways, but you know, I was competition for her relationship with her only son. And, um, and I also was willing to call out family dysfunction when I saw it, and that was a no-no in her book. But, you know, Jerry acknowledged that it, some things needed to be fixed too. So I share all of this because I have never known Jerry without that person, you know, that, that source of life, but also that weight on yeah. your shoulders. And I am and this is something I learned with my parents. Like my dad was my best friend and my mother was effectively my abuser. So losing both of them and, and love her be, and, you know, there was no guide, they did the best they could with what they had, which was an incomplete set of tools. So losing my best friend and losing my, you know, mo the monster in my life at the same time, I learned that you can actually have sadness and lightness at the same time. You can have grief and you can have relief at the same time. And I think there's just a piece of that going on and it feels really good to, to give Jerry the space also to feel all of that, that mm -hmm. we can be sad and we can also be like, 
she's at peace, thank goodness. And Jerry gets a half of his brain back and he says a third or a quarter. I'm like a half at least. <laughs> so look out world, Jerry is here. <laughs> and uh, Bo and Kelly, I don't know if, if you've known, but my mom died last Saturday. So I, I, yeah, you're muted, Bo. I figured that out logically. My my uh, condolences, Jerry. I was looking at your eyes and I was thinking, I'm not sure Bo's read the, the retreat list or whatever on this. So I, I posted it to, to the retreat list to OGM, but I haven't, I've got a, Facebook is open in front of me. I haven't yet posted it there, which would alert the rest of the world, including like, you know, the KGB and whoever else is monitoring those things. Um, but yeah. Hmm. Bo needs <clears throat> the album because the album is amazing. Yes. Was, it, was it a peaceful passing, my friend? So um, uh, mom had a stroke on the 15th. Uh, what I didn't realize is I, everybody knows that many people lose the ability to speak in a stroke. That's, that happened to her. So she couldn't communicate, but she was already kind of confused before that. So it, it wasn't just that she couldn't speak. It was that trying to point to yes or no and trying to sort out anything beyond are you in pain or not got, was really, really dicey and difficult. Um, and then what I didn't know is that half, half of the stroke victims basically lose the ability to swallow. It's called dysphagia. Ooh. And 90% of those recover capacity for swallowing within a week or two or four months of, of, of PT. Uh, but some just don't make any progress at all. And mom was being obstreperous with the caregivers at Kaiser. Uh, she was like <clears throat> trying to fight them off and all that, So which then precluded a feeding tube or anything like that. So mom was unable to swallow and feed herself. Uh, couldn't, the feeding tube was another question. And, and I know that mom wouldn't want to have restraints on her so that she could get an uncomfortable feeding tube so that, so that she could come back to a confused state of being. Um, <clears throat> so, so that led to a decision, uh, my decision to, to accept hospice care. Um, and Kaiser, the smartest thing I did in the last 20 years related to mom uh, was getting Kaiser supplemental, Medicare supplemental care, which is inexpensive. And they were just fabulous at every step. I mean, they were caring. They were in touch with me all the time. Uh, once mom moved into hospice, they, uh, they supervised the whole thing. They sent nurses every day to check in. They, the whole thing. They were just great. Wow, your mom was a styling lady. I uh -huh. love these pictures. Yeah. Wow. And you met her multiple times, right? I, I did. She came yeah, over yeah. to our apartment, my apartment on Hate Street. I remember. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. <clears throat> and uh, one thing, well, and I think you, I don't think you mentioned this yet, Jerry. I mean, Kaiser, it like outstanding what Jerry was just saying, but like that sense of you worry about end of life, you hear all these stories, absolutely superb. Like hmm. calling Jerry before his mom passed, you got calls pretty much every two, three hours. You got daily, you got daily check-ins, right. but I mean, it was, <laughs> it was, it was, but, <clears throat> but you had palliative care, you had a social <clears throat> work team, you had yeah. her doctor, you had her, you had like, they were like this well-grooved, like yeah. it was just a, a sight to behold. But the other thing is that I don't think you mentioned, um, there are special rules for hospice patients. So Jerry was able to visit his mom every day if he wanted to, but like was able to hold her hand, was able, you know, and there were no COVID restrictions, which, you know, initially kind of freaked us out and then very quickly realized that's not what, you know, if that's possible, yeah. like, 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 like take it and appreciate it. And so you were anyway, just going to call that out yeah. that we feel like it was a real um, gift of grace that 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 Jerry could be with her at all, much less as much as he was. But technically, there were still COVID restrictions in that I was allowed to visit because of hospice care, but I was only supposed to be with her for an hour a day, et cetera, et cetera. And because her assisted living facility accepted her back under hospice care, she was able to be in her room with her stuff and with people who knew her and cared for her and they, were, and they knew me so they could sort of look, you know, look the other way as I stayed for, you know, a, a few hours and, and so forth. And, uh, but I had to walk, I had to go in in full PPE. I had to put on a gown and shield and my usual, you know, gloves, the whole thing. 
but when I got to mom's room, I would sort of take off half of it. Why is your mom holding up a, a Time Magazine table of contents? Because she published the letter to the editor in that, that issue of Time. I thought it was something like that. Bravo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah. So, so going through things like this make you pretty re introspective, retrospective, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And also focus you on your own mortality because it's like, man, as you see, as you see things sort of slip and go, you're like, how do we, how do we mitigate this? How do we prevent it? What do we do? All of those kinds of things. But it's been really, it's been lovely to reflect on that. And I'm grateful that my dad was a good and frequent photographer. Hey, um, there are pictures here of Carmel. I see the, your parents on the Monterey Peninsula on the shore. Oh, that's right. You're from Carmel. So I think those pictures of them in Carmel, I think, are when mom's pregnant with me. I think, but I'm not sure. Oh, sorry. Are these later pictures? No. Yeah, well, they're, they're down here, and I, I, I know intimately know every corner of yeah. the coast, and uh, I, that's actually in Pebble Beach for sure, near the Lone Cypress. So anyway, <laughs> that why were they there? I, so, I don't. There was a Defense Language Institute. There's all that, you know. No, they were just. Uh, it was a vacation trip. I think they loved. Uh, they loved that shoreline. Okay, these pictures are amazing, my friend. Wow. Um, so how's everybody else? Oh man, <laughs> how's uh, how's everyone surviving the Trumpocalypse and the pandemic and the impending climate disaster? Well, I've been completely focused on the climate disaster side of things for for three separate projects. Mm, um, wow, yeah, uh, one of which is a how can we tell a happy story? And I can tell you stories of success, but they mm. aren't quick and they aren't fun. Um, and it, it's just the, you know, whether I'm working with a, you know, with IFTF in, in a broad tenure forecast project, or I'm working with a, um, a major home chemical cleaning product company mm -hmm. um there is this resistance to seeing this as a systemic issue um now obviously the resistance isn't quite as profound on uh, the iftf side because as i've been pounding that pounding people's head on this for years um but with the ox um it was, you know, they kept wanting to talk about climate as a marketing issue. Oof. Oh. Do, customer, do customers respond to this? Oof, oof, oof. No, this is not, a, this is not marketing. This is existential. Mm -hmm. um, and people aren't, people haven't been used to thinking in existential terms. If there is a long-term benefit to the pandemic, it might be, it might come from, giving people a very visceral understanding of what a global um, <laughs> global existential problem could look like. Yes. And what it looks like is a whole bunch of people refusing to believe it's real. Uh, I see the comments about, you know, from now on, every zombie apocalypse movie has to include a subsection of the population running to embrace the zombies because they don't believe that it's real. Um, yeah, um, and our, our plumbing system took a dive yesterday, so I'm waiting for a plumber to show up today. That's, <laughs> that's always fun. And I got to ask, Jerry, in a completely superficial and inappropriately, um, stupidly attempt, a stupid attempt at humor, yep. what's with the Dobie Gillis beard? Oh, the Dobie Gillis beard. Um, so this is a Trump artifact. Uh, I, I didn't shave the weekend before the election and then Tuesday shows up and I watched the results and I'm like, ah, oh, shit, this is going to take a while. So I decided not to shave until Trump was off stage. Mm -hmm. And so I, so I had a scruffy full beard for a while. And then Trump does the mistaken tweet or whatever. He says, president elect Biden. No, I didn't really mean that. So at that point I shaved off all of this and left a full goatee. Mm -hmm. And then as things get whittled down, I've whittled off pieces of the beard. So now I just have the, the Dobie Gillis uh, section. You're going to end up with a soul patch, aren't you? 
that's where we're heading probably. And then I, the, the, the notionally when Trump steps off stage, I shave the whole thing off. And I'm kind of fond of this. This is like <laughs> thinking, thinking works better when you have something to kind of pet. Stroke. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have to know how distracting this for April, just as someone who's married to someone who has a beard, who occasionally shaves it off in pieces. There are mornings I roll over and I'm like, oh my God, ah, oh, that's right here. Who's this guy? <laughs> <clears throat> um I've never seen Jerry with a beard <laughs> so um and my dad had a full beard which I which I loved but I have decided basically um a full beard does not look good on Jerry D nope not not a thing but um the goatee I can actually live with the goatee is it's how do I say this I mean once I got past the like would you just shave that thing off like enough I want the Jerry that I I've also figured out Jerry looks when he had a beard he aged 10 years just like without anything else and I was like oh that's scary so like the more he shaves off the more like youthful Jerry comes back <laughs> so <Nice. laughs> so I'm I'm good I'm good with where it is now I think it's been a fun experiment and I'm I'm ready to go back to you know Clean I think it's shaven a Jerry. Like 1950s kind of beak vibe with it. Yeah. Know? It's ah, really that's jealous. yeah. Furling Getty, yes. Furling Getty, yeah, exactly, exactly. Chin Merkin, ooh, that's kind of uh, kind of funky. <laughs> <laughs> I'm proud of being a Merkin. Oh, that's that's weird too. <laughs> um, and I just posted a YouTube video link to a, a, a PC forum panel I hosted. I wore a beard for a year and a half back in the 90s when I was at when working for Esther. So there you can see me with full battle regalia. And it, it, it took me a really long time to figure out that I look terrible with a full beard. Uh, and, I think I was at that one. Hey, Bill. <clears throat> Pardon? I think I was at that one. Really? That, that was my favorite panel of all the five years I did PC Forum. Uh, it was on online community. And the, it was a weird selection of panelists like Bob Kavner, what? Mm -hmm. um, but it was a great panel and at the end of it I remember sitting up there going okay this is phenomenal and I wish we could just go on for another couple hours just with this one but of course we have a program so we must get on with the show right how's everyone else coping with uh, said pandemic and everything else one day at a time in my neck of the woods well, I gotta say, you know, in Portland, where we can walk around like in my neighborhood, it's uh, it's almost like it's, it's very nice. I mean, it's not like it's almost like it's not really happening because mm. I'm glad not to be in a dense place like uh, California where you can't even go outside hardly. Um, right? I mean, we walk around our neighborhood. And people don't even bother wearing masks much because we can all avoid each other. We just step off into the street and everything. So. So it's almost that, like it's not happening. I just missed the restaurants closing. I don't know about you, Jerry. It was nice for the brief time they were open to have a decent martini again. <laughs> some reason I can't make them. You can't learn to shake your own martini? Oh, there's this French place called Angel Face near me, and they just make cocktails. And it's I make my martinis too strong. They make them just nice. We've been I discovered the jalapeno uh, olives, Bo. No. It, it doesn't matter what else you have in the martini as long as you get to the olive at the bottom. <laughs> as long as you can still find the olive at the bottom. Yeah, um, doing my philosophy stuff online with my Zoom with my friends. I mean, we're still going through Hegel. We're just, well, that's cool. philosophy has been really a, a great solace. During it's a good all moment for philosophy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Kelly, you were going to jump in? I was only going to make a crack of it. What we miss most about the bars is that the Peter and I have heard all of our jokes. It's the bartenders laughing at our material <laughs> that is really missing from our lives. So you need an audience. So you need to Basically, tip each other now. They, oh, is that? That's a good idea. That's what we'll start. <laughs> <laughs> that's really funny. I'm also going through kind of what, what to, who to give more money to at the end of this year, like my symphony tickets. I just gave all the money that, you know, they called me and they led with, do you want your refund? And I'm like, no, I want the arts to survive. Keep the money, damn it. Um, it's now, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm just like, well, well where am I going to send money to now? Because I just now just think of the world after this and what's going to be left and how am I going to save what I want? You know? Animal rescue is always a good one. 
And I was also going to say anything around um, food security, mm -hmm. food banks, um, feeding America's hungry um, here locally, here or globally. The number of people I learned about this through Dave remembers I did this thing on food. Food has been a theme that has shown up more on my radar this year than ever before. Um, the number of people facing food insecurity this year globally is going to more than double. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about hundreds of millions of people. And, you know, also, um, well, it's a separate conversation, I suppose, for a different, a different thread. Um, the future of philanthropy is getting really mixed up in all this too, because obviously a lot of nonprofits see their, their budgets just like, boom, when it was something you did optionally, right? Um, but when we think about the kinds of support services, I mean, it's interesting, Bo, because I'm with you. I, I want to see arts and culture survive. I absolutely do. At the same time, I think those real, the basic needs, um, I'm actually grateful that so long as for example, paintings can be held in a building safe and climate controlled. They're good. They're good. We can't see them right now, we, or we can see them online, but like they're, they're there. I'm much more concerned about um, food, food being a really big one. And if we can't fuel our brains, we can't really do much else of anything. Um, but also just the inequities around um, access to food, access to education, that sort of thing. So um, I was going to say something else about philanthropy, and I forget what it was, but anyway. You're, you're talking about innovation and philanthropy and changes going on. Yeah, well, that that I think this is a time that it wasn't, and I'm trying to think because it wasn't. Um, so a lot of nonprofits are are finding um, it much harder to keep the lights on, but at the same time, when we realize how interconnected and interdependent we are, we're also seeing shifts in how people want to give. Um, and there was actually just an, an article yesterday about how Venmo single-handedly redefined how we engage with philanthropy because we've made it that much easier. Um, I also found it interesting, this is separate, but that right now, you know, levels of savings are actually higher than they've been in the last 40 years. So this, on the one hand, we have higher savings, but more people being insecure because of, again, it's exposing the systemic inequities of how we access these things before the pandemic. But coming out of that, I'm just seeing, I mean, on the one, there's just a, there's a greater generosity of spirit. But again, if we don't have the basic fundamentals in place, the, the basic measures of security, the basic measures of well-being, we're kind of screwed up for everything else. Yeah, that, that line of cars in Texas to, to get food was just shocking. And then we have here in Oregon, we have the southern, from the center to the southern, all those places burned down. I gave a bunch to the Red Cross because... Uh, wow, I mean, they just lost their homes. They're gone, you know. Exactly. Uh, well, uh, and, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. Sorry. Just like in our own state, you just go south, and it's there's lots of people in trouble. Yeah, so I think if we want to redeploy our funds, I mean, there are lots of ways to do that. And we're we've received a couple Christmas cards where people typically these are family members, and they typically make a donation um, to a global nonprofit, and they're like, you know. It's not that we don't, we're still supporting their work, but they, that's the gift that we get is, you know, some kind of contribution. And this year I was actually going to go grab it, but it's, um, it's Feeding America's Home, um, Feeding America's, America's Hungry, and it's a national consortium of food banks. So, um, I don't know. Anyway. Um, uh, we have a friend, Jay Golden, who's a storyteller who lives in Ashland with his family, and Ashland is right next to the two towns that burned to the ground. Uh, in Oregon, so they that hit them hard. And uh, around that time, they actually took their family and drove east to sort of hang out with family, it's like camping uh, on their family's backyard, and then came back. But that that was really hard on them to see so many people wiped out that way. Uh, Bill, it strikes me that of all of us on the call here, you have your feet closest to the ground to all the things we're sitting here talking about, and I'm wondering how your how your world is. Well, just one little factoid relative to um, funding to nonprofits. We've got a data source that basically it's out of Vancouver. It's called Foundation Source, and they basically have data on who's giving what to whom. And they called us because of the fact that they knew we've got 70 nonprofits in our organization and said that, that statistics are showing that 40% of the nonprofits in the United States are going to be gone by the end of this year. 
And what wow. that was generating, the reason that he was getting in touch with us is that there, are, there were a lot of, of foundations and money sources, grant sources that were willing to give money to charities just to keep them alive. They didn't have to prove evidence-based, blah, blah, blah. No, just we want you alive. And the point wow. was that they're, they're afraid that they're going to be in a situation where they can't deploy the 5% that they've got to, by, by law, get rid of. If 40% of the charities are gone, so we've started to work on that. And one of the charities, the first ones that we worked with, was called Invisible Hands Deliver, which is a just a... a basically a millennial surge to deliver over a thousand meals a day to shut-ins and people like that in New York City because of the fact that they can't they can't go out they can't you know they don't know how to get the food in any event we're supporting them and we're actually going to be supporting them at the beginning of next year to expand to other states starting with California so bottom line that definitely is a, a big issue now the one thing that I thought was sort of like a, an interesting addition in the last week or so, there was sort of an announcement about this uh, inclusive capitalism um, council with the Catholic with, Church. With the Pope? With the Vatican? Yes, right. right yeah, right, I just right. saw that. And so I started doing, so I thought, wow, that's a great concept, you know, inclusive. In other words, that's sort of the opposite of what you normally hear about with capitalism, which is exclusive. In other words, it's all about me, not you, forget you. And so I thought that was gonna be great to try and sort of like support and encourage and organize around that. And then I went online today to sort of find the background of it. And for all intents and purposes, it's big business co-opting the left side so that they can, they can say, oh, we've got this covered, don't worry about it. You know, cause you read the list. I mean, first of all, the woman is a Rothschild who founded it. And then you see Bank of America, you know, Chase, you know, there was all these big companies, not one sort of little thing in, in their hundred page outline of what they're gonna do is all sort of basically, they're gonna take care of us, don't worry. <laughs> you know, I said, oh, well, good luck with that. Is it Pope washing? Yeah, well, at the end of the day, they were obviously looking for some gravitas, some sort of stamp of approval that says, yeah, we're good guys. Don't, yeah. don't don't pull your pitchforks out, you know, for us. Yeah, I, I just this conversation reminds me of how institutionalized our formulations around human suffering have become. So, yeah. a large funder wants to make sure that the forty percent of nonprofits don't go away. But we have so many nonprofits in this country because our other systems are just like really really broken. Uh, I, I, I'm struck by Peter Buffett's op-ed years ago where he said, look, uh, there's this philanthropic industrial complex and I discovered it when I attended these meetings that sometimes the right hand is trying to fix what the left hand broke. And if we fixed what capitalism is busy doing, we probably wouldn't need the majority of the nonprofits because they're all busy like putting fingers in the dike of an extremely broken system. Or am, or am I just wrong about that? I mean, my feeling, my was feeling Pete, is that I mean, was we, Peter we, wrong or yeah. were you wrong? No, I, I, I think I, th I agree with Peter. And I'm, right. thinking, I'm thinking that if capitalism wasn't hurting us so badly by by creating its perceived abundance and all that, we really wouldn't need. And if we didn't have the particular brands or flavors of ownership and uh, access and everything else that we have, we wouldn't need this whole big crop of nonprofits. Right. I agree. And, and to April's point with respect to food, I've read a statistic that we have, we generate a third more food than it would be required to feed the entire planet. Mm -hmm. We just don't have the distribution system, you know, and apparently for like 10 or 15 years, there's been a group that was organized a long time ago to try and see how they could do that. But in essence, as you can imagine, big corporations don't want to really support that. They don't really want to make that happen. They, they want to shovel the, the extra corn or milk or fill in the blank out the window and say, no, no, we've got scarcity. Forget the abundance aspect. Yep, yep. Yeah, abundance is so relative. Uh, there's, so Richard Nixon told Earl Butts, agriculture secretary, to go create cheap calories. And so, so Butts basically put in motion a lot of the stuff that turns into high fructose corn syrup being, and, and grains being insanely cheap. Uh, so fat, fatty carbs being too cheap to actually compete with, 
in, a, in other kinds of ways. And, and from there tumble a whole bunch of health issues that cascade over to somebody else's department. So why would, why would Earl Butts care? Um, but we've put in place all these massive policy things around assumptions and around politics and around everything else that also hurt us. So, so I, I, how do we hit the grand, the grand undo? How do we take advantage of meltdown, which is what I call this phase we're in, which is a combination of pandemic, Trumpocalypse, climate change, Black Lives Matter, Me Too, uh, plus name your, name your favorite crisis and sort of drop it in there. How do we take advantage of this meltdown to actually create fundamental institutional change, meaning in the Donella Meadows leverage, leverage points in a system to change the assumptions that design the system, the assumptions that are behind why the system is the way it is. Right. I mean, I'd love to go, I mean, it more deeply into your, your positive scenario, because I, I feel like that's one of the missing pieces, kind of, is we, we know what we don't like, we don't have such a strong idea of what we do like, kind of. And yeah. even like the notion that this is capitalism is bad. It's like, what do we mean by that? You know, you, right. you don't like markets, you don't like money, you don't, you know, what is it? What's that mean? Um, and I, I've been trying to, to, you know, do the regeneration framing and, and like make a pitch to get, to do some fundraising for our little nonprofit. I should probably get onto that. Um, and the argument I'm coming back to is, um, you know, the UN secretary says the world's broken. And then Buck Minister Fuller says, you got to have a, change in system, you can't use the same system, all right? So I think we're that far. And then it's like, well, okay, what's the new system? And I'm calling it regeneration, right? That's what we want, we want regeneration. Now, I don't know what regeneration is exactly, and I think it would be useful to flesh it out more, but you know, it has an abundance component, it has a, a positive sum component, and you know, I mean, I think we could kind of define some of these things. And I would love to do some, some brainstorming around what we, you know, what this better world that is different from the current world starts to look like. And I mean, I'm even laughing at the, the link that Jerry, that you put in here for the inclusive capitalism one. I mean, look at the goal. They're gonna make the world fairer, more inclusive and sustainable. They're not gonna make it fair or inclusive, just better, you know? And it's like, well, if you're gonna set out with that goal, just don't even bother. Um, so anyway, I'd love to like, what is the, what is the scenario in the world where you do actually win, right? What's that look like? Well, so first of all, food, shelter, and healthcare should not be at stake for anybody in this society. Period. Well, I think that's a requirement. It's like in this future world, these things are granted. Now it still doesn't get you the how, nope. but it, it gets you a minimum set of principles that you want to have in that yeah. system. And like in America, it's we have such a multi-layered, corrupt, inefficient. Like first of all, healthcare in America isn't even capitalistic. It's it's so it's it's a bunch of a fat cat oligopolists in a structure which makes no sense either for actually delivering healthcare or for the efficient deployment of resources. It makes a lot of sense if you're going to give a bunch of profit margins to a bunch of politically connected people. Um, so that that's a the fundamental thing. That I see a bunch of these arguments in America aren't even set up correctly. It's not even you know, it's not capitalism versus single pair. Capitalism isn't really what's going on in our healthcare system. And frankly, people are just gonna be sick of it and we'll go to single payer. And I'm fine with that. I'm done playing this game. So a couple of <laughs> thoughts. Um, when at the time of Trump's election uh, and some of, the, some of the introspection I did back then, I was thinking like if, so Trump wants, I think Trump wants to dismantle government, but if Trump went in and dynamited the Department of Education, I would be applauding from the sidelines. And if you wanted to get rid of the farm bill, I would be like, dude, you like go, right? And those things haven't happened. But one of my fears of Biden coming in is that if he doesn't cause enough profound change of the nature that we're talking about, we're gonna have Don Jr. as president in 2024 or Ivanka will be the first female American president, ironically. And I just caused Kelly's neurons to go into like total Fritz overload. Um, and mine too. I like. Yeah, I just internalized it. I like I look calm, but that thought gives me the, the willies as well. But but I th I think that that reinstating sort of Obama by Clinton's kind of kind of history, which is the, the shepherding and of the status quo, which is broken, um, is a real mistake. And we're seeing the cabinet forming up. We're seeing sort of the, the initial the initial swings at how to how to and and Biden is being handed a play a tray of steaming shit. Like, like, and, and on his way out, Trump is damaging everything he can damage. 
and possibly creating a parallel government in exile inside the nation that will refuse to cooperate in any way whatsoever, which is like also cataclysmic. <clears throat> so anyway, I think that our opportunities are right on the table because we can communicate for free. These ideas are, are, are burgeoning. And I'm gonna put a couple links in the chat. I, I collect up, you know, promising solutions to world crises, which is like the 2% solution, Simpol. There's a whole bunch of smart people, uh, donor economics, a whole bunch of smart people have put a whole bunch of interesting theories and practical projects in the world. Not all of them have worked well, like Earth Island Institute didn't really work all that well, et cetera. But, but how do we distill the lessons from these and propagate the best ideas out of them so that local communities can adapt them to their own situations? Because my own prejudice on this is that the people on the ground are the best, best available to understand their situation and act on it. And if somebody from outside says, hey, just do this, it doesn't stick, it doesn't really work. Like you can best practices all you want, but coming in and telling people what to do, I don't think ever particularly works well, so. Well, and, and I mean, I'd be curious again on in the, you, all you futurists, whether this is, a, was this is true or not, but I've ended up with one of the differences about regeneration is that it's an opportunity focused thing. You're not trying to solve problems. You're trying to, to create opportunities. And the reason that matters is if you're solving a problem, you're inherently stuck in the last paradigm, right? That by definition puts you back in that old framework. So I feel like this conversation that we have can't, shouldn't be based on the problems we're seeing in the current system. It should be based on some kind of backward, backcasting version of what the future is we'd like to see. But is that true? Does that work? So I'm going to, um, I'm going to speak in favor of, um, or at least as a devil, from a devil's advocate perspective, I speak in favor of uh, slow conservatism. Um, basically, what Biden do not expect radical change from from Biden. I did not expect radical change from Biden before he announced a single person in his cabinet. Yeah, this is not. I don't say it's a caretaker administration, but it's a stop digging administration. You know, you're in a hole stop digging and all of these much better solutions are untested or at least untested at scale and if they don't work you make things worse and at least that's i think that's an arguable perspective that you if you have a choice of doing what you know works ish is you know won't make things worse or doing something new that might think make things better but might make things worse and it takes a lot of going to take more time for people to understand it it's safer to do the thing that you know how to do that isn't great but isn't bad and or at least they they can believe that it isn't great but it isn't bad and so i really think that th what we're seeing with biden is very much a let's do what we know seems to work and not make things worse. But it wasn't working. Um, now that may or may not be, it may or may, may not be accurate, but I think yeah. that's the perspective that's coming into this, is that it's not yeah. a, you know, we are champions of the status quo. It's a shit, we gotta stop making things even worse. And, you know, once we stop digging, then we can figure out how to actually make things better. But coming in here and Trying to do all sorts of wonderful new things is just going to scare people who are already precarious mm -hmm. and might not work in the way we expect, probably won't work the way we expect it to, might not work the way we want it to, and potentially could cause the system to go even further into collapse. So I, I, I may not agree with the perspective, but I totally understand what they're, why they're doing this. And I will say I got a tear in my eye when the first cabinet announcements came out and it suddenly dawned on me that competent human beings who cared for the offices they were about to step into would have their hands on the tiller at some point again. And I'm like, whoa, I hadn't, that, hadn't, that hadn't entered my head. I'm like so happy that Biden appears to have won and that might actually become president that, that all the repercussions, all the extra, hey, Susan, um, all the extra sides of it hadn't dawned on me. And so I was like weepy when, when I saw the first people showing up uh, as, as you know, cabinet members and other, other important positions because competence and, and caring yeah. and, and intentions. Yeah, I think first of all, they're, they're trying to stop depression. And 
Janet Yellen is clearly all about that. And not neat things about her is she's a labor economist. Exactly. And, and most of her work is about inequality. Yep. So um, that- do you, remember, do you remember she got castigated because of the fact that she mentioned you know, the, the whole concept of, of being concerned about inequality when she mentioned that? She got lambasted when she was on the, on the Fed. Yep. They don't wanna hear that. She's the first Fed governor to even ever mention that. Wow. Right. Um, so yeah, yes, that's right. So, um, so right now, I mean, that thing that, that Stephen Munikin did, the uh, treasury secretary of trying to take the money back from the Fed that they were using to prop up. Um, Crazy. Realize in economics, there's this thing whereby having the ability to do something, you know, it's, it makes it so you don't have to do it. So the Fed didn't even have to spend that money but everyone knew they had it, knew they could do it, so they never weren't even challenged. So uh, that is literally, that's trying to burn the system down. That's, mm -hmm. um, and so we obviously want to stop that, <laughs> but I was just thinking, historically speaking, all these, um, there was this female labor secretary under Roosevelt, and she's the one that got unemployment done. She's the one that got just, all these things we take in the modern world, happened in the 30s and 40s under one person in Roosevelt's administration. And because, you know, the whole social contract of America was completely rewritten in the 30s and 40s. So, um, I mean, uh, that is an opportunity that lies in front of us. And it's almost, if we handle the depression to, and, and manage to avert it, we might not have, shall we say, the raison de tour to actually do these kind of wonderful things. Um, sorry, I have to think as a realist. Uh, um, because, uh, you know, in the Depression, they, they decided to tear the whole social contract up and rewrite it. Um, anyway. Which, which, which the far right has been trying their mightiest to undo ever since. Like, mm -hmm. like They're still like, mad about Social Security. They're still mad about that. Absolutely still incensed about all those things. And the far right went nuts at that point and is still nuts about all these things. Yeah, and so the, uh, and so the Green New Deal sounds to them like the doubling down on this terrible thing they've been trying to hit undo on all this time and so they're just not you know they're not in with the program at any level on those states and so how do we how do we shift ourselves around the table such that we can actually begin to solve problems together because that's crucial if we if 72 million people voted for trump and the entire republican party is too frozen to acknowledge biden's victory because those 72 million might then like bomb their home. I, I think a lot of politicians are actually afraid of physical violence if they, if they don't toe the line. They're, they're yeah. actually afraid of physical violence. It's, it's not even, I you know, can't act on principle, I might not get reelected. I don't think that's the level at which some of these people are re responding right now. Hey, and don't um, forget in the, in the depression, we had World War I veterans striking in Washington and MacArthur went out there and just, we had the threat of violence then too. The, bon um, the bonus uh, marches, yeah. And the, well, another thing that's really important is I want to stress to everyone is that it's clear to me that the depression happened because of policy errors. It was mm -hmm. utterly oh, yeah. caused by policy errors. Um, and uh, what's really fascinating about it is that we had like a year and a half, things are getting better. And then we bounced the budget and threw everything right back in. And we did that like three or four times all the way to World War II. It was shocking. We kept just atavistically running ourselves back in the ditch. Um, and the Republicans are talking right now just like they did back then. So don't count the ability of us to go back in a depression and because it wasn't this exogenous thing that just hit us. We kept screwing up. So just policy error caused the depression. Just make sure we understand that. Okay. And is that was that happening globally? Yes. Those, those policy errors were happening so, globally? So, so the first good book of history I ever read <clears throat> was Tragedy and Hope by Carol Quigley, who was a mentor of Clinton's at Georgetown, taught foreign affairs. It was presented to me, not well, it was mentioned to me by John Taylor Gatto the first time I met him in New York. And he said, you want to read some good history? Try this. And, and I've forgotten a lot of the, the thesis, thesis, but basically it went into describing how in the Great Depression, each country's sort of policies created a logjam against the other countries. They, they, were basically, they were basically stuck against each other in a way that they couldn't untangle um, because of stupid beliefs and, and uh, bad assumptions and foreign policy and God knows what. 
but but it was an international mess that 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 um, was exacerbated at local levels each way. So it's, the, the history of this stuff is fascinating. Yeah, in fact, the way Europe dealt with Greece and everything, uh, they went into austerity. Yeah, which is exactly how we caused the depression. We kept going back into austerity. So the EU is at a turning point. Are they going to finally? Is are the Germans going to let them spend money? Or are we going to bounce the budget and go to hell again? Um, so, Bo, Bo, let me just comment to the extent that I was just listening to a, uh, a talk by Yanis Varoufakis, who was the Greek finance minister at the time that they went under. And he was saying that be prepared for the next step, which is going to be going into more austerity when Germany begins to shift toward surplus again. They basically opened the gates to non-austerity because of the fact that they were having problems. The minute that they solve their problem, they're gonna shut down the rest of Europe. Just mm -hmm. because of politics that they, they, they just can't get away from, like you're saying, that sense that somehow austerity works, which it doesn't. You know, anybody who's followed my, you know, Mark Blythe or Steve Kane, they, they, they tell you over and over and over again, austerity is the worst thing you can do when you try to do it across the board. Who is gonna be on the upside? And so part of what's happening also right now with the advent of automation and the sort of the deconstruction of work and jobs and all these other things is that a whole bunch of people will be systematically unemployed and, and will have a very hard time finding their way back in. April's been doing a bunch of speeches and work on the future of work and sort of the, the delamination of the economy and, and so forth. So we're, we're, that plus pandemic and economic mess means we may need to make our way toward basic income or other kinds of, of really different solutions from what we have right now. And, and so the, the world of where shelter, uh, shelter, food and healthcare are, are, are rights of some sort seems mentally, conceptually really, really, really far away from where we are, like right. really especially, far away. But we may, be, we may be shoved there. Especially if you add the ingredient of the fact that the 1% want more unemployment so that they've got more pressure to keep the, the cost of labor low because excuse me, you know, if you spend it on all this social stuff, we're not gonna have the money we need in order to build the economy. So you know, it was interesting when April was mentioning the, the savings rate is up. I don't know whether anybody has really sort of followed the fact that, that we've got a glut, a absolute worldwide glut of money and it has nothing, nothing to do with savings. It has to do with the, basically the, the Fed and, and all the governments pushing money for the benefit of the banks and protecting the banks. And, and so we've got this glut of money out there that's only available basically to the 1%. Nobody else can get their hands on it. Um, in economic theory, there's something known as the iron law of wages. Bo, I'm wondering if you're familiar with this. And it, it's not called the law of wages. It's not called some economist's law. It's called the iron law of wages. And what it says is that, I will quote from my brain, wages tend to the minimum necessary to sustain the worker. Right. It basically says as an economic precept or a baked in assumption that wages can never be fair, can never be like where somebody could actually thrive. That's not, that, that doesn't happen in economics. Wages go to the minimum necessary to sustain the worker. It's this, and, and to me, this is like brilliant marketing. Brilliant marketing from assholes who are trying to make sure that labor never adds, actually has a seat at the table, gets its fair share, and that right. people, people can't be sus sustainably nourished in some way. But it's called the iron law. And when somebody calls something like you, like my, my BS radar just glows bright red, I'm like, right. oh, this is juicy. Um, so, so we have so many stupid things baked into economics. Hey, what about that uh, on PBS last night? I love watching that news hour that, with Leslie Stahl. Uh, there was a great story on the labor participation of women. Wow, women are dropping out of the workforce like crazy. And also how they're being hit this time versus 08, 09 because it's all the service industry. It was men that got it in 08, 09, and this time it's large, it's much more women. And people of color. Yeah, yeah the last And watch out. 400,000, the, the last report, there was 400,000 people that fell out, you know, that dropped out of the labor market. That's mm -hmm. amazing, huge. Huge numbers. Susan was gonna say something, go ahead, Susan. No, I just said, I was going to say, I said, watch out. <laughs> I mean, if, if the, 
the women and the minorities get whatever enough, maybe we'll be in the streets. I, I think there's a good argument to be made that um, one of the things that made the, the large scale Black Lives Matter marches and protests possible over the course of this past year was the um, pandemic driven recession. You had so many people out of work or working from home yeah. who, had, who suddenly had the space to act. And I think it makes, makes a good argument or it gives good support to the idea that people are a lot more radical in their beliefs than they're able to be in their actions simply because of the need to survive. And a lot of that has been in some sense let loose recently. I mean, one of the effects of Trump normalizing all kinds of craziness in the world is that people feel um, agency to go out and act and, and do a bunch of like stupid ass things. Um, they're kind of liberated to do so, it's been sanctioned. So, so it's okay. So, so the Overton window for acceptable behavior was shifted dramatically by, by Trump, exactly, the Overton mouth. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I, I know you, you've you heard me make this argument, um, but the idea that, you know, it, those of us who were on the internet in its early, early days, you know, really celebrated the idea that what the net enabled was for marginalized communities to actually form communities. People who felt isolated at home, isolated in their small towns, et cetera, could actually meet other people with similar beliefs, orientations, et cetera. And we took it as a given that that was a good thing, not realizing that not every marginalized community is, uh, should be unmarginalized. I mean, that basically gave the same power to neo-Nazis that it gave to LGBT. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think, it, I think you, you're seeing a similar thing here with the, um, the enablement of action. Uh, that's you know come out of this last year and that it gives us the same potential to act and to act out to people who want to kidnap the Michigan governor as to people who want to march in the streets to protest p police violence. Well, I'm, I I'm not trying to uh, sorry and I'm, and I'm not trying to say make make any kind of claim that they're the same thing or have the same level of morality or anything like that but it's simply it's the same um openness you know, uh uh, availability of agency that they didn't have before. Susan, you appear to have something you'd like to say about that. I will I'll calm down. I'll just thank Jamé for saying what I've been trying to say for years, but oh, I don't okay. understand <laughs> saying it nicely. And um, so thank you for that. Um, <laughs> but I still don't understand how anybody could think that wouldn't happen. Do you remember the Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace by John Perry Barlow? Oh, yes. It was, it was an incredibly optimistic and heady time. I know. And I know. so I, I think people just thought that, this, that we, by having freedom, we would do good. And a lot of us did, but not everyone. And I think that was one of the hard lessons of, uh, of the rise of the internet. And uh, I don't think we are really have fully engaged with yet. Right. Well, I think that's true too. Yeah. Can I can I complain that we're still digging into what's wrong with the current system? And I haven't yeah. heard a lot Please about do. what the next one looks like. Kind of. I mean, I feel like we keep getting trapped in this, you know, what's going wrong with our world thing. And I don't know how to break out of that. So can you say a bit more about what regeneration means to you? And then we'll go to April. Well, I mean, in some sense, regeneration just means all the good things, right? Um, which I think is kind of the problem because it needs to be kind of realistic. But the, the reason I felt like I had an epiphany around it was I felt like there was a range of thought that I'd been trained into and learned and stuff, you know, through the Kennedy School, through economics, through business that I was not considering. And it, it has to do with abundance. It has to do with positives of outcomes. It has to do kind of with language choice and stuff, um, the, a sense of possibility. 
Um, so I really do think that that the you know the the framing is exactly in that uh, website that you posted. You know, I was just trying to tweet it, Jerry. But the but the idea that we want to make things more just. No, we want to make things just, and that's a big step, right? And I wasn't making that step. So the sustainability scarcity model is an improve the world more slowly, and it's it's a lose more slowly strategy based on incremental change. And what we need is a winning strategy. And what is that winning strategy? So regeneration is the winning strategy. And regeneration so, has lots of different facets to it. There's regenerative agriculture, there's regenerative economics, there's other kinds of regeneration. There's restorative and, justice. There's, I mean, I think in every sector, there's like a regenerative probably, but I don't know what the words are. Yeah, and by the way, this relationship economy thing that we're sort of standing in, it was, was an attempt to phrase and frame those kinds of issues. So all the regenerative stuff fits really beautifully inside of, inside of Rex. Uh, April, then Jermaine. Hey, April, can I jump in since I have to leave in two minutes? Oh, yes, please. Uh, it's so great to see everyone. That's really made my day. <laughs> um, so I, I just wanna say a few things and I, I love this conversation and my exploration has been what needs to shift in the dynamics of the system rather than what structures need to change within the system. And it's a very um, strange path that I'm on, um, but I, I feel like it's a both and, like there's a lot of conversations happening out there around um, what could this look like? How do we get there? But not what is the quality of the interactions and the relationships and how do we get there? So hopefully I can jump on some more Rex so I can just <laughs> pull wisdom out of your hearts and brains uh, as I'm on that path. And I have to, to, to jump on a, a call here at one. <clears throat> thanks, Todd. Nice, lovely to see you. And Good to see you. Thanks for leaving that, that note with us. Uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chime in just very briefly. It's more to um, further, well, it's, it's not in relation to the the problem it's it's so i i've been really struck and and maybe this is some constructive cr feedback criticism but like criticism for for rex as well as what i've been learning about writing my book is that dave to your point like we are really good at talking about the problem here really good at it and one of the things i i mean i love this group but it, we need to be about solutions. And one of the things I learned about, um, I have to give book presentations and this, that, and the other. And it's, depending on who you talk to, it's like the 60, 30, sorry, this, the 30, 10, 60 rule or whatever. But that like, we need to spend more than half of our time. You need to get to the solutions as quickly as possible. Cause I think here, like we, we get the, the many different facets of the problem and how the problem, you know, like you do not sell a book by talking about the problem. You sell the book by telling people what your books, what your book holds that actually has hope or a path forward. And so I just bring that out because I feel like um, that I adore, I, and it's not just about Rex, but I think this is one of those groups where we're really good at like going through all the different things and that's wrong and that's wrong and that's wrong and that's wrong. And I'm like, how do we actually apply some of this regenerative thinking <laughs> in a way to our own structure, to the container that we're all sitting in right now, not Zoom, but like Rex. So I was just gonna make that point because I'm like, yes, this is exactly, I think this, this like lights my fire, but also I'm learning because um, I've even, I've had to put together some presentations and I've discovered how good I am at describing the problem. But realizing, I mean, that's, and then I'm over my word count before I've even gotten to the, the solutions and what I want my book to do. So <laughs> I'm trying to sort of share some of the medicine that I've been having to take recently. <laughs> that's oh, a, a cup. I'm oh, sorry, go on, Susan, please. Oh, I was just going to give a resounding yes to that. And one of the things that I've, I've noticed is that if we just take the words, the problem solution language out, and put it aside, okay, and not let ourselves do that. So I, I, what I've been substituting is resolution to, and it's nice because there's resolve. And, um, and uh, when you were saying, David, that part of the regenerative thing is to shift vocabulary, I find that very powerful. Um, and problem is that of course, 
then things turn into memes again, <laughs> you know, and we're just like that and language is like that. But, uh, but I think, I think, yeah, I think resolution and is, is a nice way to think about what needs to happen rather than solutions. I, I put in the chat a little earlier that Russ Acoff used to talk about dissolving problems. Uh, that way about dissolving problems instead oh. of solving problems, which is yeah. also a, a sweet sort of uh, linguistic jujitsu. But he, but he actually sort of did that. He would reframe problems in a way that, that suddenly, uh, uh, one, minute, one minute story, because it's, it's, it's memorable. Uh, he was in a consultancy once where his office mate uh, was working on the London transit system where the conductors were dragging the drivers off of buses and beating them up during the day. And they were trying to figure out labor relations, what's going on here, everything's broken. And so Russ asks his colleague, so how, like, how many buses are there? And, uh, oh, and it, so, and then his colleague sort of tells him, how many, how many stops are there? And his, his, his uh, companion tells him, and it turns out that uh, drivers are being compensated for meeting the schedule. Conductors are being compensated for collecting all the fares on the bus. And at rush hour, this turned into a shit show because they couldn't do it. So Russ's answer was at the beginning of rush hour, conductors step off the buses to the stops and collect all the fares at the stops. At the end of rush hour, they step back on the buses. And he sort of dissolved the problem by just thinking in a way that you wouldn't normally do. Like, you know, why would you have the conductor step off the bus? Well, they can't make their way through the bus because the bus is packed, right? And, and they're, they're beating up the drivers. Um, so anyway, that, that's an approach. And then also appreciative inquiry, which I've just, I haven't practiced enough, haven't gotten my handles around enough, but appreciative inquiry starts with the belief that trying to solve problems creates negative discourse because you know your head goes where your body goes where your head is looking. And if you're looking at the problem, you're kind of diving in into the problem. And it also gets you into he said, she said, and you did it first, and you know, you took our land before we took your land, <clears throat> and all of that kind of thing, as opposed to what might we do now that's really productive. And with that, I will end a series of just, just uh, digressions that, that uh, interrupted Jamey taking the floor. No, no, and uh, interrupting me is always the right course of action. Um, <laughs> so three things. Uh, first is um, with regards to the problem solution, the language that I, that I like to use is dilemma response because dilemma mm -hmm. um, takes away a normative aspect of saying we have a good outcome and a bad outcome. Sometimes you have a choice between maybe one's better, but they're, they're just too, both difficult and you have to choose. You have to respond to an issue. And so basically trying to get away from, you know, pre, um, declaring that there's always a right course. Maybe sometimes there's not a right course. Uh, so dilemma and response. Uh, secondly, another language thing, uh, David, you've been talking about, you know, pushing back against the inclusive capitalism or whatever it was called because the, the fairer language. See, it, uh, what it immediately put me in the mind of safe sex versus safer sex. You know, back in the early days of the, uh, of the, the movement that was a response primarily to AIDS that moved, you know, went beyond that, safe sex was a language. And they realized, no, 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 safe sex is an ideal that we'll never really get to. And people, when they can't get to it, they decide, well, I can't do this all the time, so I shouldn't do it at all. Safer sex was saying that this is something that we can accomplish. You can, you don't have to be perfect as long as you're better. So safer is actually a, was a, uh, a more useful, uh, more useful language than safe in that, in that context. And I would just say that that is true in the problem solving context. You were you you reduced the problem, right? It was it it didn't it didn't stop AIDS, right? But it reduced the incidence of AIDS. So it made it was better. Right. It was better, but it was not a win. And that's kind of the so I'm not sure that this well, this framing works very often, but but I don't think we have it enough, right? I feel like the 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 what's the winning strategy framing, it just isn't out there enough. We're too dependent on the the scarcity sustainability model, which is we'll do a little better, a little better, a little better. We'll never do better. We'll never do good enough, right? We're never going to sustainability ourselves into climate change repair, right? Because right. we're tackling the wrong end of the system, right? We're, 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 we're treating a symptom and we're going to try to reduce the impacts of that, that symptom, yeah. 
but we didn't solve the problem. So we have a no. losing strategy that is widely adopted. I, I love Bill McKibben's comment that if you heard somebody describe their marriage as sustainable, mm -hmm. you wouldn't think that was a very good thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, and yet um, Bill McKibben is dead set on stopping climate change. You know, it's like, okay, but what are we gonna do about biodiversity loss? What are we gonna do about water, water shortages? What are we gonna do about, it? right? I mean, it's-, it's and, and that actually becomes, and that actually be, helps to point to the, the, the argument for taking the, if not incremental approach, a less than full win approach. Because by laying out the scale of the problem, that is not just climate, it's biodiversity, it's um, habitat change, it's, uh, you know, you sort of go down the list of things that make it bigger and bigger and bigger, and we have to do all of this perfectly Oh, screw it. I'm just going to play video games. It, it, I think no, but trying to cast it as you either, you, you either do this perfectly or you have failed, that makes it really difficult for people to feel like they, that it's worth putting the energy into, energy into and money into because they don't think it, it's going to work. But let me just try but to, one, I want to get to the third. I, oh, sorry. Sorry. I wanted to get to the, the third of my, of my points um, just very quickly. Um, and it's, responding to, I think it was something April was saying about articulating things as, you know, we're really good at articulating problems. We're, we're problem describers, not problem solvers. And I have, you know, and I was actually just talking about, you may remember the bit, very beginning of the call and I was talking about all the stuff around climate. It's not just people, you know, it's not just people who um, are looking for the solution because they understand the problems. There's a lot of people who just simply don't recognize the scale of the problem. And when we talk amongst ourselves, we, we, it's great we should talk about solutions, but we should also recognize that we're unusual, this group is unusual in that in the level of, the, of understanding of the scale and nature of the problems we face compared to people and organizations who have other things to worry about. Um, and so I just, I, I don't want to, I, I, I don't want to uh, denigrate problem description as being a, uh, you know, being useless. It's not, it actually can be very useful if you, especially if you're getting people, getting organizations to recognize, you know, that they've been, they've been intently studying a blade of grass and not realizing that they're facing a, you know, a, a savanna. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, like the, like I said, you know, the example I gave early on is that it's, you know, this company saying climate is a marketing issue, a, a, a consumer or customer communication issue, because that's the way they've framed these things, mm -hmm. not seeing the immensity of, of the issue. I guess the example right. I would so use. I'll start off now. Go ahead, Dave. I was just kind of, I mean, like, I'm sure there's value in an analyzing problems and, and I'm not really saying that we shouldn't do that. I, I'm just saying we don't do the alternative very much. Mm. And in the case of the, for me, the, revel, the, the realization of the climate change issue, right? Which is, I strongly feel is just a symptom. And I strongly feel that we're playing whack-a-mole with these symptoms, right? So we're not, I think, in a winning frame place. And to me, the, the alternative is not like, do the analysis of climate change better. The, the response has been something like regenerative agriculture. Let's change the framing completely to a positive framing where let's just farm better. And if we farm better, you get the satisfaction of a better farm where you have more nutritious food, you sequester water and you sequester carbon and you're getting making more money and your animals are happier. And, and one and of the byproducts is you're that you're addressing. To. And you're oh no, you're, you're, on, to you're, on a, you're on a, with, with you're on a serious, you're, well, you're on a better path than we are today, right? So okay, even if you so took you, the problem again, analysis it's, it's, framework- It's safer, not safe. It's better, not best. It's just one part of it. That's why I'm asking for this view of a future, right? That enables us to address these problems you're identifying, but without, without trying to do the scarcity analysis. So what is this abundant, possible, positive sum future where regenerative agriculture is an example, right? that gets us down the right path, right? right? What are the other things we can do and how does that look? That's the imagination I'd like to have. Yeah, I, and, I, and I fully agree. We, we don't want to be constantly striving for minimum sufficient solutions, which is what we've 
what we tend to do. You know, is this good enough? Um, you know, it's the iron law of solutions, I guess. Mm. You know, is, is this good? It's good enough. And so I, I fully agree with what you're saying, but putting it in, but I see it in the context, not some, not just of our conversations and, but in terms of the conversations I've had with people in organizations who have actually, who are actually in positions to do something, do they recognize the need to do something to make a radical change when they've, you know, what they've been thinking about all along is let's do the minimum sufficient because it's least harmful. So let me, let me throw four quick things in the conversation. One is uh, Acuff also used to use the French word problématique. He said there, in the real world, there isn't just a problem you can isolate and, and optimize a solution for. There are systems of problems. And the French word problématique is systems of problems. We don't really have a similar word. And that means that to fix things, you have to tweak here, tweak there. You have to have influence and make changes in lots of different places. <clears throat> Second, uh, the framing of dilemmas, which Bob Johansson has been on for a long time as well, um, makes me uncomfortable on the one, this, I, I'm totally divided on it. On the one hand, I like dilemmas because they, they give you a juicy framework to sort of address things. On the other hand, there are some cases in which if I need to flip you from scarcity mentality to abundance mentality, and if abundance mentality will actually make a better world, uh, that's just not a dilemma. That, that's like, it's gonna be a better world and I need to flip a bit in your head so that you see that if we collaborate to create abundance, that's a better outcome, period. And, and, I, and I don't think that's just a dilemma where I could go either way. And dilemmas put me in like this squishy netherland where I'm like, eh, it sounds like I, both, both solutions in the dilemma are, are equally valid or possible. Well, that's what you're, you're, you're jumping from here to there without to looking at the intervening path. Yes, yes. The, the, the scenario that you are in the um, abundance versus the scarcity. Yes, go for it. That's great recognizing that it's likely going to be an extremely costly path along the way as we transition systems in the real world of people who have to, you know, send their kids to school and, you know, put food on the table, put, put food on their family to quote the inimitable George Bush. Um, you know, and so getting from here to there is where the, the struggles live. So the last two things I want to say uh, was, um, so Klaus Mager is in the OGM group, uh, and he is a big proponent of regenerative agriculture and, and sort of flipping the model. And he made a really simple statement, which I really, really, really like. Um, industrial agriculture is one of the largest causers of degradation of the earth and climate change and greenhouse gases and everything else. If we manage to flip most of it over to sustainable regenerative, to regenerative agriculture, uh, it would not only stop doing the crap that it's doing, but would heal the earth, uh, increase aquifers, like it fixes six different problems, right? So, so that, that, is, it, that, that lever with a lot of little farmers doing a lot of small changes on a very local level, le level. And, and Dave, I keep going back to singing frogs or jumping frog far singing frog farms that you, uh, that you and I and Claudia visited. That, really, that visit was really informative to me. Um, but if we can if we can do that over and over again, that catalyzes into really big changes that are positive but it's on every that front. Curve. It's the curve that you're not looking at, or at least that it seems. What's wrong the, with the curve? Yes, we we know that it's bad here, and we know that it's ideal here. But how do we get from here to there in a way that isn't going to temporarily, temporarily make things worse? And I've, that's I think that is the when you're breaking system, broken systems, even if you're breaking it to replace it. Broken systems hurt people. So I don't I guess think- I, I might I think be right, but I, I also feel like we don't have the new vision yet. So I think you're, you're one problem ahead of us. Okay. Maybe, okay. In the regenerative meanwhile, case, it's unclear <laughs> how much- Meanwhile, hurt. meanwhile, the farmers in India are, you know, in the streets and the, uh, the big firm, you know, Reliance, what's his name? Reliance Capital, yeah. Yeah, uh, no, Reliance Industries, the, the, the two brothers. Um, Anyway, I met one of them once. <laughs> I was on I was on his retreat. I don't retreat with him, you know. And it's like uh, a different Mr. Ambani. Ambani, yeah. Virubai yeah. Ambani. Yeah. And Ambani, yes, he has a little place on the other side of the Bay of. I imagine he has a lot of little out of places. out of out of uh, Mumbai, and you take a little boat over this flat stuff to a, a nice little camp that was probably built by the Brits. Anyway, so. But 
but that that they're talking about taking over agriculture and making it industrial in India. India has regenerative agriculture, right? And we tried to give them fertilizer, which probably was, I don't know. But right now you're taking whatever the, the pieces are that are capable of doing what they do. And that's uh, <laughs> me. Mm -hmm. Last of my four items was oh, to sorry. wonder, but that's okay. Because that, that what you just said added to what I was trying to head toward. Um, I wanted to head back toward Dave and regenerative things and what does it mean and where does it go? And what I like about the term regenerative is the re means that you got to redo it, maybe that it existed before, maybe that the process itself should be reflexive. The, the re is really nice because it, it, it sort of informs me about the process and generation or generativity is in general for me a positive thing where to me sustainability and resilience are like, how do we hold the baseline against some kind of force against us? For me, thriving, flourishing, and regeneration are much more positive. And what regeneration forces me to try to do is to think of ways to watch the system and try at every turn to improve the system by tweaking the system. So if I can increase soil fertility, if I can have cows graze on, and Joel's, uh, Joel Salatin's chapter in Omnivore's Dilemma uh, is, was my eye opener on this, like you know, every cycle of cows on the on the on the on the farm improved the soil and the grass because of the timing of the cows and the manure. Uh, very briefly, you leave the cows on a patch of grass for for three days because in four days they've chewed the grass too low; it doesn't grow back fast enough. So in three days you move them off, and then you leave that patch of grass uh, lying for three days. And I'm making up the numbers here because in four days, the maggots that are in the cow pies turn into flies and you have a really bad fly problem. But in three days, all the cow pies have a lot of maggots. Who loves maggots? Chickens love maggots. So you take your rolling hen house, you drop it on that piece of grass. The chickens go crazy, tear up the cow pies. They mix that, the, the cow manure into the soil, which makes the soil better. They then poop their very nitrogen rich and phosphorus rich poop into the soil, mix that in and then move them off and let the soil grow back a little bit. And, and every cycle, the soil is better, the grass is better, everything else. And I'm probably idealizing this whole system, but, but that system of watching and tweaking all the, and I don't see, I don't see how everything breaks if we shift to that kind of system from industrial agriculture. I'm not getting your thesis, Jemay, that if we cause any large scale systems, we break them all. I do not buy that. Um, and so I think that small changes done in a lot of places with experiments with local adaptation are gonna work phenomenally at global scale, phenomenally. And I, I just used the analogy earlier, we were talking about change as a VLCC, uh, you know, as, as like, you know, sometimes you have to turn the large ship. I'm like, no, this is more like a swarm. This is, this is more like a murmuration of starlings where the individual farmer is a starling. And if they can turn, if, if a bunch of them turn then and the ones next door go like, oh, they're turning, I should turn too. We can turn a whole bunch of entities quickly towards some new target, towards some new way of seeing their relationship to the earth, their relationship to each other, their relationship to chemicals and industry and business, et cetera. I, I, Ecology of Canadians, I like that collective now, that's good. So I, I, well, this is great, it's like the parents arguing. And I'm not gonna get <laughs> I'm not going to get uncomfortable about this, but I, I want to pick, pick favorites, Bo. You have to pick favorites. I'm going to pick where I'm going to go where Jamey's going. I think what Jamey's saying is when you change the status quo, there will mm -hmm. be losers, and you can't be blind about that. And uh, that's what I see Jamey's point about. And I, in so, in zero sum calculations, that would be true. Uh, but all but that, oh, it's just what, like, if you're in, what if you're in a positive sum? You, you change agriculture, so there'll be all these industries and people and interests lined up to with the old way. So all of a sudden, their their way of life is gone. It's just like saving the old growth forest here in Oregon meant that just drive through Oregon. You just go through town after town that's dead <laughs> now because we saved the old growth forest and their jobs are gone. Yes. Uh, and, and 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 on building on that, there are uh, costs that will be uh, limited one-off maybe, but there will be costs associated with transitioning your physical infrastructure from one form to another. Maybe you haven't been raising chickens. Um, you know, you've been a cow only farm and now you have, there's a cost. And I'm not saying that these are insurmountable, no, but they not. exist. No. And, that, and, that's, and this is something 
I've argued and I've gotten into a, with a lot of people over the years around idealized futures is that we can't just talk about the future without talking about the path. That's why I like to think of futurism as um, anticipatory history. Oh, I love that phrase. It, it's, we're not just describing a point in the future, we're describing the path or the pathways that get us to these different kinds of futures. And that sometimes means, and, and, and the example, I, I, something I said very early in this call, that it's, we can talk about ideal, you know, ideal successful climate futures, but getting there is going to be tough because there are costs along the way. There are changes that end up needing to be made. There are <laughs> costs that need to be paid. There are people who will consider themselves losers of economic power without, but still have lots of political power, potentially even military power. And getting from here to there is gonna be difficult. That doesn't mean that it is, it should not be done. It just means we should go into it clear eyed. Mm. Before passing the baton to April, really quickly, one of my other lessons from visiting uh, uh, jumping singing frog farms was that um, the moment you've shifted to natural farming, you've made enemies of the John Deere sales dude, the Monsanto sales dude, and the fertilizer sales dude, uh, and those are the wealthiest people in town, and they go to church with you on Sundays. And, and so, so one of my conclusions from that is one of the most important things we can figure out is how do we help those people transition and how do we create new community for the mavericks who are making the change so that they don't feel alone and isolated. So all, all of the, those things factor in how you change. And then there's a whole bunch of policy questions that just crept in my head or just don't go to church, which uh, yeah, let's, let's start that <laughs> conversation. Go ahead, April. I was just gonna tie in some of what I've been working on. Um, not, it's, not a, as, it's not about regeneration per se, but it is about how we rethink and reshape our relationship to change. Right. What we're describing here is change. Right. And problems are often changes you don't want. <laughs> right. Um, solutions are changes you do want. So we can have a lot of fun with language here as well. But one of the main themes of what I've been writing about, it's and I talk about like the superpowers you want to develop to be able to better navigate change. And one of them is the ability to see what's invisible. Now, that might sound a little trite on the surface, but Jame and Dave, what you've both been saying we need to help people, we need to help though, help everyone see. If, you, if we want them, if we want people to, to follow a new way of being, of working, of living, of farming, of whatever, they have to see. And I think Dave, it's exactly the positive sum piece. They've got to see what that looks like. Because we can tell them, you can tell them story, you can sort of walk them through the, um, the charts and the presentations and this, that, and the other. And it, what's hard is that until they sort of sense it and feel it and experience it, they, they, they may not see, but, but there's a lot we can do in terms of un sitting and listening and talking to people and understanding how do they see things? Because it's not just what you see, it's also what you don't see, right? And right now we, and I don't figure, literally figuratively, but figuratively, we see what's visible. We see what's right in front of us. We see what we know. We don't see what we don't know. We don't see something. We don't see stuff we don't know about, right? So how do we help people see this better path forward? How do we help? And part of it is storytelling, but, but that also is far from complete. Um, far, part of it is also being um, collaborating and, and sort of co-creating, co-generating some of this stuff. And I think about, you know, right now, agricultural, industrial agriculture is so embedded where they are because they see a known system that is destroying the environment, but that they know it will benefit them individually in the short term kind of thing. They don't see a different scenario. Any scenario they see disrupts that system, but they're not necessarily, they don't, they don't know what, how do I say this? They don't see what they're not, their eyes aren't trained to see. And can we help see what's, and I use the term invisible just broadly <laughs> because I, I think you get what I'm saying. It might, it might not be more, more crucial than that. It might be that their culture and their community enforces not seeing those things, that, that they can't see them because it's a prohibition in their way of seeing 
from their culture, community, religion, what have you. Uh, go ahead, Dave and Jamay arm wrestle. I was just gonna, I was just gonna say that. Yeah, I, I love the way you're saying that, uh, April, and and the, to me, and that was what, where I had gotten kind of was as far as this hypothetical future is a paradigm shift, and kind of by definition, I think you don't see paradigm shifts, right? I mean, that's that's why they're a paradigm shift. So, I mean, I and and in the context, I'm just bringing my problem into this venue for you guys. So, part of my the background of the question, uh, Jamay, is I've been working with this group, the Global Regeneration Collab. This is this thing that David Hodgson spun up a year or so ago. And, and the framing of it is, the, the, my current framing is, it's, it's like a maker space for regenerative change makers, right? And so we're, we're raising the people and developing the culture that will enable this kind of regenerative framing and future and vision, right? So, so in, in some sense, I'm trying to figure out how to bridge to the future, right? I mean, I'm trying to kind of create some infrastructure that will be part of whatever this transition looks like. Um, mm -hmm. And it still feels to me, even in this context that people who are kind of inclined, we need a better vision of what it is they're inclined towards. You know? So that's, it's that shared vision kind of thing, the seeing that I feel if we had that, then our makerspace would be better. Mm -hmm. And we would know and more what culture we want to reinforce, right? Because we would, we kind of know the principles and the predicates that we're trying to strengthen. Yeah. So, and um, just, go ahead. No, go on, please. Just very briefly, I was going to say, in my various conversations with people in agriculture, including big food and all of that, I don't, what's interesting is big food, they, they don't want to destroy the environment. They, they realize that they're in the early stage of an, existent, of an existential crisis, maybe not so early. Like their, their goals are remarkably aligned but they don't see how they get from here to there. So that was for me, not a wake up. It was, it was actually quite encouraging. A lot of people in industrial agriculture don't want exactly where they're heading. Mm -hmm. And yet they don't see a way that they get themselves off this path, especially individuals, you know, that are one cog in a much bigger machine. And that's like, that was, a, a real eye opener to me to realize, oh, we, we collectively need to actually help one another see, and it doesn't have to be everybody, but like there's more alignment than we might think, even though the business models look wildly different. Well, that goes back to, um, I, I just told this story recently. So if I told it here, I would just point to it and say, but remember this, <laughs> and, and I don't know if it was here. Um, in discussions I've been on mindset shift, which is also language that some people use in this in this kind of situation and you know how does it happen and uh so uh, one of the things is to look at the ones that have worked you know and and so i was thinking of the cuyahoga river did i talk about that here oh no oh, no oh the one, the well river I, on fire yeah I, I happened to be thinking about this at the time that the Cuyahoga River caught, well, they caught fire and the 50th anniversary was not too, a couple of years ago. And, um, and I just, I don't know, it just tweaked me to say, go back and start reading about how in the world they cleaned up the river. Because you had all these different parties, right? You had the fishermen, you had the people who wanted to go swimming, you had the shippers who, we're running into things in the, in the things we're burning up. And it was like, it was just untenable for all of the people who partook of the river's fun, abundance. And, and I, what I concluded was that they, they, they did, they had a shared thing. I mean, they, a sh what, what, what a philosopher told me was shareable, a shareable uh, kind of thing that they were looking at. And the shareable thing in that case was everybody wanted a clean river. So all the different parties kind of figured out their way of handling what they needed, what part of the river needed to work for them and how to get it there. And uh, it took 40 years for that to happen. But when you go back and look at that story, it just, it struck me that you have all these different, <laughs> to overuse the term communities of practice that have a way of looking at things and they have their own culture and they have their own ways of doing it and, da, 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 and they change those. So, but it was, it was by taking what was already there 
and and pointing them to that, you know, don't you want a clean river? But what would it take? You know, it was just, it yeah. was it was so common sense, and I thought, how come we don't study those more? I think because that was a rare event where your the goddamn river right in front of your town is on fire, yeah, and water's not supposed to light, and it was so unnatural, so dangerous, and yeah. so obvious yeah. that everybody's like, okay, this is really screwed up. We must fix it. But yeah. so many of other other problems aren't that palpable. It's like climate change, climate disaster, man, this is a slow moving, you know, slow moving massive thing. Yeah, but People the only way it. that that's gonna happen is a lot of those small things. I mean, if you, yeah, the, the scale we're looking at here is the scale of small things. Um, and we don't know how to, we don't quite know how to kick that off reliably. And, but if you look around at the, when I was, I spent some time in David Hodgson's group a couple, years ago trying to figure out what was, what was going on. And, and, I, and I thought, good, okay, this is good. This is a good thing. It's not my thing, but these people know what they're doing. And this could be, this is definitely a good thing, a good way of thinking about things. And of course, um, having lived in different places in the world makes you sort of see that you don't know everything, right? Um, and, and there really are different ways of going about things. Um, so it's it's going it, the future is 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 lumpy <laughs> a little bit lumpy and and absolutely and it's um and call you, you can't label it good or bad when it's going on because you have no idea right it's it's an article of faith which faith is a weird thing um in contrast to belief um Absolutely. Uh, you know, one thing I, I keep thinking is uh, the Great Society, uh, Johnson. I mean, essentially, Johnson walked around and like, why do we accept these problems? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. Why are we accepting? Why are we accepting like you know what a third to half of American children? We are essentially flushing them down the toilet, and those same children, who's going to build our future and pay our Social Security? I mean, I mean, to me, to say that these problems aren't like these problems are right in our front of our faces, and if you live yeah. in California, mm -hmm. you know climate change is real. If you live in Florida or in the Gulf of Mexico, you know climate change is real. And, and it almost seems like we, we keep thinking that we're, we are not- but I'm not sure that they think that this, this is climate change. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm not sure that connection. Yeah, I'm not sure they're all making that- connection. just horrendous outcomes all over the place. Like, right, but they well, don't make it, they, they, they might be due to something else. I mean, it does not we didn't, sweep, we didn't sweep the leaves out from under the trees well enough. Uh, I tried to do that one Thanksgiving before Thanksgiving dinner. We we got the rakes out and we went out and raked my forest. Oh my God! How well, long? just for the hell of it. Oh, I am. <laughs> I have a picture of us standing with our rakes. You can't want to come to dinner. You got to bring a rake. Where do you where'd you put where'd you put the leaves, Susan? <laughs> well, dumped them in the river. Set them on fire. Yeah. <laughs> the leaves. Uh, well, it is an interesting thing because we just had the chippers cut. We've just been mauling our forest in the in the hope of not burning ourselves down. Or at least what prompted me was, could we clear up the brush around this dirt road here so that when I drive out, the trees are not, burning trees are not going to fall on my car because the fire trucks don't want to come in if, you know. And so uh, we went through this, got grants. Now I'm now I'm on the board for the South Skyline Association of all things, and it's like, oh my God, why did I do this? <laughs> but <laughs> we uh, anyway, the we, we cleared all the brush, and we, we trimmed and trimmed and trimmed and trimmed, and then we had truck loads, truck loads of leaves <laughs> and chopped, chopped up stuff. Uh, which and is good mulching material, right? I mean, you, you can sell that off, can't you? Uh, Don't people like wood chips for, for mulching for regenerative agriculture? They don't like wood chips from, you know, sudden oak death trees. They don't like, I mean, even though they're not supposed to, yes, you can sell it and you can get rid of it. I mean, what I do yeah. is make a big pile and my, my Russian tenants wanted to build gardens and I've had to shut my mouth. I just have to, because I've been through this. I know what it, you know, I said, so oh, there's all that stuff over there. We can turn that into <laughs> soil. We can, mm -hmm. yeah. 
uh, it's like I'm living in several centuries at once here. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Um, so we've gone, we've gone over our, our 90 minutes. Time flies when you're having fun, I think they say. Uh, and I'm really happy that we solved all the world problems. Hey, David, thanks for pushing us today. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry to be in the, this is this is my thoughts for the for the week. So you guys have been hugely helpful. Thank you. And Dave, I want to I want to talk with you about uh, Open Global Mind working on sort of the food and farming system and and like how how we might like double up efforts up there. So oh, that'd be fun. Yeah, yeah, that'd uh, be fun. Well, let me let me ping you and we can have a conversation about that. Yeah, uh, and John May, you have to tell me why I was wrong about India. Uh, what? <laughs> I, <laughs> why you were wrong about India I don't well I was just know. saying it's ironic that we should be talking about regenerative agriculture and how and how it's going to how w ways in which it, it moves forward and the fact that India is about to dismantle village India is what they're going to do mm -hmm. well it doesn't make it, it clearly doesn't make enough money for someone well, the, to a, of the world is who it doesn't make enough money for. Not it yet. doesn't make not enough yet. money for the farmers either, except they eke. They, they eat. do eke out a life. They eke and eat from that. You know, and I, I was in India, in the village India, in the middle of Madhya Pradesh in 1965. And it was a beautiful life. Yes, people died of tetanus, but. So before the British Raj, before the British show up and basically take over India, India yeah. is self-sufficient in food and textiles. Yeah. Self-sufficient, like doing just fine. Thank you very much. Um, and then the British illegalized the loom. Like I didn't realize the depths of it. I didn't realize why, <laughs> why Gandhi was all uh, like spinning his own yarn and the loom yeah. isn't important. No, the, the British said hand looms in villages were illegal, turned India into a plantation for cotton to send to uh, Manchester and other towns in England to be yeah. made into cloth to be shipped back to India. Yes. Like, like, like the, the, the scale of this is, is stunning. And so, so the British basically broke um, all these systems in India and subjugated the entire continent and screwed things up for a really long time. And don't forget salt. And oh, the salt, oh, yeah, salt. And, yeah. And the salt march and salt, exactly. I like, like, they just ate the country. It's really weird. And they ate the country by turning one ethnicity against the others. They, they sort of made buddies with the Sikhs who were good warriors and the Sikhs became the guards. And then you, you sort of divide and conquer and use the minimum number of Brits who were usually the third sons of aristocracy because the first son is gonna inherit the second son's the hot spare. The third son's gotta go find fortune somewhere in the world. So the third sons of aristocracy were out there basically running this shit. And uh, the British chartered corporations basically were private armies that were fully empowered to go launch wars and do whatever the hell they wanted to for their own behalf. As long as it came back to the crown as like, like imperialism and the British, like the, the whole thing is just sucked for so many people. Right, so, so did our own country, if you recall. Yes, there is that. And somebody was saying, how could we fall for all of this fantasy stuff? And there was an Aspen talk that I was watching this morning by to Kurt Anderson? I can't remember. It was about it was about um, uh, how why were why are Americans so prone to fantasy? And and the hypothesis that was being put forward was that because the British, that's the people who came were the people who responded to these wild stories and advertising. The utopian by, fantasies. By yeah. Well, that's interesting. If you can find the talk, can you put us in on the Rex list? Yep. Uh, that'd be great. Um, somebody needs to talk about kittens and puppies or unicorns briefly so that we can end on, a, on an up note. Anybody? Uh, we can show little videos of pet ferrets. That's always cute. You Good. can watch yeah. Bored Panda, you know. There's always Bored Panda. There's a couple of threads that are like, you know, only good news kind of, kind of tweet streams. And you so know, forth. that, but good news is it's so boring. It's not warming, but it's, it just isn't like disaster. You know, it doesn't have the the taste. The, um, the smell you of the smell of gunpowder. Look at the in the morning. Right. You look at the subreddit Happy Cow Gifts. <laughs> gifts. <laughs> but See? it's a whole bunch of animated gifts of uh, happy cows frolicking and getting pets and yeah. Where are you talking? Where are you, you talking? Go. Awesome. Yeah. So how? All right. How? I gotta go. Quick, quick. I gotta go too. Okay. Thank you, Jerry.
Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody.